Welcome to the second episode of Breaking Monero. Breaking Monero is a series of episodes where we explain the limitations of Monero security and privacy in a comprehensive and understandable way. Today, we are covering an introduction to ring signatures and their history. It's important to understand ring signatures before talking about really anything else in this episode's series because they all really build off ring signatures, or at least to do for, for the most part. But before we get there, um, we have Sarang on here, and I would, uh, Sarang, can you introduce yourself really briefly? I know hopefully they saw you in the previous episode, but can you also cover some basic terms for some people, the idea of plausible deniability mm -hmm. and the idea of heuristics? Yeah, so um, like you said, I go by Sarang Nother, um, and I'm one of the researchers, uh, PhD researchers who works um, on Monero research and development on behalf of the Monero Research Lab. Um, my counterpart being Saray Nother, um, who's not able to be here today, but was on the previous episode to talk about a little bit about an introduction to the series and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so ring signatures are a topic that come up a lot. And as we're gonna talk about later and in future episodes, I would say they're kind of kind of the, the pain point and the sticking point for you know, issues that people have with Monero. And one of the things that we've had to deal with iteratively over time in order to strengthen Monero for people. So in this episode, like you had said, we're gonna kind of go over just a very brief overview of kind of the structure of how they work. We won't go into the mathematics. There are definitely good resources if you're really interested in that. Um, but we're gonna talk a bit about their structure and kind of lead into later on why that structure can lead to some problems. Um, I mean, to kind of start out with, you know, the sky is not falling, ring signatures are not broken, whatever that means. And we're gonna talk about, they do exactly what they say in the box, um, but they end up leading to, I would say, annoyances and things that we try to iteratively improve on. Um, so you had mentioned the phrase plausible deniability. And that's a phrase that we sometimes use when we talk about Monero's sender ambiguity. And I wish it was a phrase that was used more often um, because as we talked about before, people like to throw around words like private and fungible when they really don't have any formal meanings. There, we have intuitive things for what we assume private or fungible mean in terms of a digital asset, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of tough to nail them down exactly. So I like to kind of, kind of branch out Monero's privacy and anonymity guarantees into three parts. Um, sender ambiguity or privacy, if you want to call it that, um, recipient ambiguity or privacy and kind of amount and or metadata privacy. Um, so in general, receiver um, anonymity and amount anonymity or amount metadata, you might say, are in general very, very good. So what happens is when you choose to send funds to someone with Monero, and they're not directly linked to your wallet address. I mean, I have one or more Monero wallets for which there are addresses. You know, I can receive funds addressed to those and I can use funds addressed to those to later send to other people. So. Justin has a wallet address, he gives it to me, and then I you know, somehow send funds to that using my Monero client. Um, but what happens is the wallet address itself, that if I'm sending funds to Justin, never actually appears on the blockchain. You know, that's, that's, that's huge. Instead, what happens is I effectively generate kind of a one-time, we call it an output or note address sometimes, depending on who you ask. And that one-time address is what actually appears on the blockchain. So wallet addresses never appear there. It's an important fact to keep in mind. There's a difference between those, and it's kind of a subtle difference that's easy to miss from time to time. Um, but the idea is when you're sending funds to someone, the recipient, their wallet address is never known. I basically kind of bake that recipient address into the one-time address in a way that's not reversible. So someone looking at an output that I generate that's destined to Justin, no one can tell that it's destined to Justin. Justin's knowledge of the private key that corresponds to his wallet address allows him to later spend those funds, um, but he can't directly determine anything about that address. Um, similarly, as I think we may have mentioned in the last episode, you know, things like the amount of the transaction, um, those used to be um, known in Monero for various reasons, um, but now those are basically kind of tied up in what's called a cryptographic commitment, and that's what led into the whole idea of like range proofs and bullet proofs, that was a big point of discussion before, but that's also very, very good. So the amount of your transaction is private, the recipient of your transaction is private, um, but we often like to talk about sender ambiguity, and that's where ring signatures come into play. So effectively, if I'm sending funds to Justin, I would have to take some funds that I had previously received in a so-called one-time output that was destined to me. And I don't want to just necessarily send those to him. You know, in another, you know, in another alternate version of Monero, perhaps, maybe you could do that. You know, where I take that one, that output one-time address, and I basically sign it over to Justin in some sense. Effectively, what I'm really doing is I'm generating a new output one-time address, and I'm basically signing for it using the one that I had received. And when done properly, this can assure everyone that you know, the money existed before and that I controlled it and that nothing you know, funny happened. Um, but effectively in Monero, we wanna obfuscate that even more using plausible deniability. So what I do is I basically take that one-time 
output address, you might want to say, that was addressed, that was destined to me that I wish to actually send to Justin. But I'm also going to take a bunch of other random, and random can mean many things to different people, but I effectively take other one-time addresses that I don't control. Now, unlike things like CoinJoin or other mixers, I don't need to actually co you know, collaborate or cooperate with anyone to do this. They have no knowledge of what I'm doing, and that's an important part of this. I basically take other random one-time addresses, and I use those to form a structure called a ring sometimes. And what I do is the ring signature is basically a way to say that I know the private key that corresponds to one of these output public keys in my ring. And what this really means is that I use the private wallet address that I hold, because of course those funds were originally addressed to my you know, wallet address. I basically use that private key in order to generate the private key for one of these outputs. So again, that's that separation between wallet addresses and output addresses, which can be confusing from time to time. And effectively, a ring signature just says that I controlled one of those, and also that certain things involving the amounts end up balancing properly. So what happens is an outside person, you know, whether or not Justin is the one, you know, making this uh, verification of the ring signature, or anyone who's, you know, synchron synchronizing the blockchain and ensuring that it all was done correctly. They, of course, need to know that all these signatures are valid and that I actually control the funds and that I'm actually signing them over to Justin. So in that case, they can you basically perform a verification of the ring signature. And all that verification tells that person is a couple of things. It tells them in particular, first, that one of those out one time addresses, those output one time addresses, was the one that I controlled. Importantly, though, without revealing which one it is. So it says that one of them was, in this case, the true sender. So true sender in that case does not mean a wallet address. It means an output one-time address that was generated on the fly when funds were originally sent to me. And it also shows in particular that those funds weren't double spent. So kind of the cleverness of our ring signatures, they have a property called linkability. That means that if I were to grab another random ring and try to respend those funds, because remember, that particular one-time address, that output public key, that might appear in a bunch of other rings. Ideally, it will appear in a bunch of other rings when other people randomly grab it alongside their own. But I also need to make sure that that one wasn't spent twice. So the linkability property, which involves things like key images, lets us make sure that not only did I control one of those outputs, the one that I controlled was also not spent in another ring. So it's, it's a lot of info kind of packed all into one structure called a ring signature. Um, and as we're going to talk about, there are limitations to that. But mathematically, it does exactly what it says it's going to do. So effectively, I have plausible deniability. I could say to someone who says, well, you know, one of those output public keys in that was belonged to you. You could say, well, you don't know which one it was. And in particular, that output public key that I do control probably appears in a bunch of other rings, and I had nothing to do with those transactions. So it gives you some deniability about what was actually spent. That is what public key I'm actually signing over to you effectively. We also have like, I think you also had kind of hinted at the idea of what are called heuristics too. Exactly. And here's, yeah, and heuristics are, it's, it's kind of a subtle thing to talk about, but it's an important one, right? Um, so, you know, a good example of a heuristic, right, is, you know, let's say, for example, that I ask you to come up with a number between one and 10. And let's suppose that I ask you to write that number down and I ask you to seal it up in an envelope so that I can't see it. So I turn around, you write down a number between one and 10, you seal it up in an envelope, I don't get to see it. Now I, being a smart person who knows a little bit about, you know, statistics and such, I happen to know that in general, people will typically not choose the number one or the number 10. It's actually true. People don't like the idea of like extreme values. So I think to myself, you probably didn't write down one and you probably didn't write down 10. In particular, I know that I think it's like three and seven are the numbers that are most typically picked if someone asks you to pick an original one and 10. So I might think to myself, aha, I bet you picked seven. And statistically, if we did this game over and over and over again, and you behaved like you know a rational human being does, more often than not, you probably will pick the number seven in there. But here's the thing. Unless you actually show me what that answer is, I have no idea if that's true or not. So effectively, what we would do in the kind of ring signature heuristic case is you would do this, you would write down your secret number, you would like put it in the envelope, I would say to you, I think you pick the number seven. And instead of telling me, you just like eat the envelope and walk away. That's a heuristic. <laughs> Can I do anything with that information about you picking seven? I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe that has some significance in our real lives somehow but it's not checkable, it's not provable. It's just me using information about how I think you're going to operate in order to gain some information that I might try to use. So there's kind of like, there's, we're gonna talk a lot about different heuristic approaches to ring signature analysis, but those things are not necessarily the same as any kind of proof. So that's important to keep in mind. There are a whole lot of different pieces of metadata and patterns of usage that we've iterated on over time to deal with heuristics.
But it's important to remember when we say heuristics, we do not mean a proof. So can you do something with the heuristic? Absolutely. But is it, any, is it provable? The answer is no. So rank signatures, when used in the ways that we're going to talk about correctly, do provide plausible deniability, even though an adversary could try to come up with heuristics over, in particular, what they might think the actual sender of a ring signature is. So it's important to remember, mathematically, ring signatures do exactly what they say on the box. They provide plausible deniability absent external information. But as we'll talk about, different kinds of external information can allow an adversary to, in Monero's early history, find out actual provable information, and later on in its history, you know, determine heuristic information that's not necessarily provable. No, I, I just really like that heuristic example because it helps keep things in perspective. So there are some things that probably break down your plausible deniability, um, things like zero decoy that we'll talk about in future episodes, mm -hmm. where you can look completely based off Monero's on-chain data and say, based off this information, I know for sure that something occurred. For the heuristic case, you're using other information, um, but, but normally you need to have other information brought on the side in order to really uh, corroborate this sort of this information and ground truth to say mm -hmm. that, yeah, this is sort of my guess, but I still can't check your envelope, right? I, I still can't go figure out what the ground truth is. Maybe your ground truth is talking to my friend who says that I always write down the number seven and then you would, I mean, it, you get closer, right? You get a, an additional piece of evidence to keep refining that heuristic further and further. Right. So. I think it's really important for people to understand the difference between uh, the way we talk about Monero's privacy in relation to plausible deniability, where we say, okay, like at the minimum, we're making sure that you have like on the Monero blockchain, independent of anything else, you have plausible deniability. You have other information mm -hmm. where it, it's not ex uh, essentially a very clear path within the Monero ecosystem, you're sort of protected. But when you start throwing in a ton of outside real sort of information, it gets really complicated. And I think it's really hard for people to understand that. And that's mm -hmm. why we're talking about it at this, during the series. Well, yeah, and it's something that you know you don't typically have to think about in real life. So it's, it's something that's kind of artificially constructed when we deal with systems like this. But they are important to the security of those systems. So, and I mean, a lot of it also has to do kind of with your risk profile or your so-called threat model or threat profile, right? So. You know, Monero's ring sizes today, for example, are 11. So if I'm sending funds to you, I choose my real, actual, you know, the one that was destined to me, one-time address, and I take 10 fakes just off the chain, and I form a ring that's of size 11. So mathematically, absent any external information, if you were to guess which of those one-time outputs was actually the one being spent in my transaction to you, you know, statistically, absent external information, you have a 1 in 11 chance. So, you know... What does that actually mean in terms of like real plausible deniability? You know, if you're, you know, dragged before some court or magistrate and they say, aha, we have somehow through external information figured out that one of the outputs in this ring belongs to you. Were you involved in some shady business? And you can say, well, mathematically, it's a one in 11 chance. You know, is that good enough for your use case? Well, that depends, right? I mean, that depends on the legal system and all sorts of other things that are, you know, outside of kind of the mathematics of Monero in particular. Um, Maybe that is a big deal. Maybe it's not. You know, before the episode, we talked about kind of an example where you said, well, okay, use the example of like Voldemort, right? Voldemort is a super bad guy in the Harry Potter universe. I'm told, not a Harry Potter fan, but I'm told that this is true. So, you know, perhaps Voldemort sees that you, you know, one of your one time output keys occurs in a ring and sees that, you know, it is a one in 10, one in 11 chance that that's yours. Or maybe the rings are even bigger someday and Voldemort sees that it's a one in 100 chance. You know, maybe under that threat model, Voldemort doesn't really care about the law, and Voldemort just like casts a horrible spell of death on you anyway. <laughs> well, you know, in that threat model, the fact that you were basically using Monero at all meant that you're kind of hosed. So, you know, it really is dependent on your threat model, and that's not necessarily very comfortable to tell people, right? You know, when you say how much plausible plausible deniability is enough plausible deniability for me, that is entirely dependent on your situation. You know, as we'll talk about later too. You know, we believe in the Monero community generally that the use of ring signatures when done correctly is the best current way, you know, to safely use digital assets. So whether or not that applies to you really depends on your personal threat model. We believe that for most threat models, it's sufficient. But, you know, always important to keep in mind the Voldemorts of the world, right? If the fact that you used Monero at all ends up somehow implicating you, then, well, that's a problem for you.
Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Serang, so much for that introduction. Um, sort of to re-summarize about ring signatures, uh, they allow users to send transactions or the outputs or notes, as they're sometimes referred to, kind of like individual dollar bills, mm -hmm. appear to come from more than one plausible location that can come from several. And without ring signatures, like you have with Bitcoin, it's really clear what source of funds is actually sent. But with Monero, we make that a bit ambiguous by saying it could have come from one of several places. Right. I mean, in, well, I mean, in Bitcoin, they do, in fact, have a similar type of signature. It, the mathematics is different, but effectively, you do the same thing where you basically sign, you know, a note over to somebody else, in effect. Whereas Monero, you are signing on behalf of one of a possible group of notes to someone else. It's kind of a generalization. Yeah. Um, would you say that, like, uh, ring signature is used as a... Uh, as a technology to hide where Monero is coming from is a good way to get the point across, or is it a little bit of a sim oversimplification? I think it is, because when people say where it came from, I think they often assume that it has to do with wallet addresses. And remember, that is not the case. So to be absolutely clear, like your wallet address that you can look up on whatever Monero app you use, the really long one that usually starts with whatever, four, for example, that never appears on the blockchain, ever, ever, ever. It is not mathematically possible, you know, unless you tell someone additional information for some random observer to look at transactions on the blockchain and determine what address they came from or were destined to. There is no way to do that. Instead, remember, you effectively generate one-time addresses. And those are the things that actually appear in rings and are signed for. So Yeah, so it's almost like when we say it hides where the funds are coming from, it's sort of it's it's, it's, sort of it's effectively to yeah, it's effectively a, a it's effectively another level of obfuscation that we yeah. often don't talk enough about. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, yeah. cool. And then, yeah, and, as, and, as, and as we'll talk about later, you know, if you interact with other entities like exchanges that have additional information, then, you know, they might be able to gain additional information. But, you know, if you're not being silly about things, it is not possible to, to kind of make that linkage back again. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll take the time now to talk about the histories of ring signatures in Monero, just so we can sort of see how things were and how we sort of have address changes in the past in order to try and make them better and, and involved in the past to previous major concerns of Monero. So ring signatures were made in sort of their, their current form, their, their similar form in 2004. And the original perceived use case for, this, for these were voting, where you would have several people vote, but you want to make sure that one person doesn't vote twice. They actually called these uh, linkable ring signatures, not because you can trace who is voting, but you have this sort of key image component like we have in Monero mm -hmm. to prove that someone isn't just selecting sources of possible votes and casting them multiple times. I believe right. that was sort of the initial thought. Yeah, process. yeah. When we talk about when we talk about linkability in like this cryptographic construction sense, we're really saying, you know, is it possible to link two signatures as having come from the same source, even if you don't know what that source is? So the idea of actually identifying what the signer was is a property called traceability. Um, and there are many different constructions on how to do a ring signature. You can generate some that are traceable. You can generate some like we do that are linkable. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a general type of cryptographic construction of which there are many examples. We use one that's very suited for what we want to do. But as you had said, there's many other applications that have been discussed. Um, and I'm sure you could come up with many more if you sat down and thought about it long enough. Yeah, so the interesting thing is the CryptoNote protocol, which was published in 14, though they allege it was published in 2012, um, <laughs> uh, it sort of took the idea and said, hey, instead of voting, let's make this use for sending transactions where we can make it appear that they're coming from several different stealth addresses. These outputs are coming from, the, the, the transactions are coming from several possible outputs uh, instead of just clearly coming from one specific area. And this is a pretty novel application um, because it allowed you to do a sort of mixing process but it did not require uh, interactivity. Um, so other systems at the well, time were and, yeah, and that's And that's actually very, very important because part of the deniability um, is that the out, one of the outputs that, I mean, if I'm spending an output to you, for example, that output is very likely to appear you know, under normal transaction volumes in many other people's rings. So ideally, the deniability comes from the fact that you can look at a bunch of different transactions, all of which reference you know, the output that I happen to secretly know about, and I can deny all of them in theory because, you know, even though one of them may be the actual spend, it might not be. So it's very, very important that we have that property. Yeah, and it just really helps with user experience too that you can do things offline or like you don't need to talk to someone or get someone else to work with you to, to sort of sign a transaction. 
I think right. that's one of the best. Uh, that, that's the reason why people were originally interested in ring signatures and the crypto note protocols, because you had this sort of, in one way, people sort of saw it as a non-interactive mixing, right? Right. It is, it is a non-interactive process. Yep. Yeah. You don't need the cooperation of anyone else whose outputs you're referencing in your own ring. Sweet. So, Soren, can you take the time to walk through sort of the early years in Monero's history from when it started to, uh, I would say, maybe through 2017 when Monero started adding Ring CT? So up to Ring CT. Sure. Can you talk so, about some of the, um, like, how well people really understood Ring signatures? Were they well understood? Were people sort of speaking inaccurately about them? And can you walk us through some of the initial research you were doing um, to document some of these early limitations? Yeah, absolutely. So the if you go and look at the CryptoNote white paper, you will actually see a, ring, a linkable ring signature scheme that is not the linkable ring signature scheme that we use today. Um, the scheme that we use is more efficient and has some other nice properties. Um, so you know, it's basically it's based on a uh, scheme that Joseph Liu came up with. Um, which again, academic work, especially in mathematics, builds off of other work. So, you know, questions of who invented this are well, it definitely the form that we use is a slightly modified version of a paper by Joseph Liu. The original one was more closely related to a different scheme that was in some ways less efficient and less useful to us. Um, so, you know, we can we can debate about the history of it in particular as much as we want to. But you know, Monero did not invent this. The CryptoNote, you know, authors did not invent this. There's a novel application of some academic and mathematical and cryptographic work that had been done prior to that to start out with. Um, so we basically use a, a scheme like that. We actually have modified it since, um, in particular, because we need to integrate the ring CT scheme, which, you know, the, the basic structure of the ring signature is basically essentially the same. Um, but there are some modifications that help us work with these encrypted amounts that, you know, aren't very important to what we're talking about today. But effectively, um, originally when this was used, ring signatures were basically optional. So, you know, in theory, you can have a ring of one possible signer. That is one possible note that I've plucked off of the chain, one possible one time address, output address, whatever you want to call it, that I'm sending. In that case, there is no plausible deniability. You know, if you know that one member of the ring had to sign and there is one member of the ring, you know, it does not take a very smart bear to figure out what that signer was. And again, it was optional. We're like, optional transparency is good, right? And you know, to some extent, you know, Monero, we believe that you can always give information to someone about a transaction. That's always possible. So in some sense, optional transparency is in fact a good thing. Um, but that made optional transparency very, very optional. So there was no minimum, um, there's no minimum ring size effectively, with the exception of one, of course. So we sometimes call these zero mix-in transactions. Another term we sometimes use for like the fake outputs that I'm pulling in are mix-ins because they're fakes that I'm mixing in with my real one. Um, I don't really like that term, but whatever. Mix in zero is ring size one. Mix in one is ring size two, and so on and so on. Um, but effectively with those, you had, you know, essentially you had no sender ambiguity in that sense. Remember, that still doesn't reveal the wallet address of the sender or the recipient because you don't have that information from the chain, but it did mean that there was no ambiguity in which of those notes or outputs was actually the one being spent. So it was very quickly realized though, that this was not necessarily a good thing. Um, and we'll talk very, very briefly about this. We'll go into more, you know, kind of a, you can call them attacks on this a little bit later on. Um, would you like us to talk a little bit about the zero mix-in problems as they apply to, to other larger rings? So we'll have an, an entire episode on zero mix-in. So I would okay. keep it, yeah, keep it sure. at a high level. Sure. So, so again, you know, even though having a zero mix-in or ring size one transaction removes sender ambiguity. You know, you still have that extra layer of obfuscation caused by one-time addresses. So does it immediately identify you as the wallet address? No, it does not. Um, we'll talk later about kind of how we um, at Monero Research Lab and other members of the Monero community and elsewhere, you know, realize that there were other consequences to this. Because remember, you know, a ring signature doesn't really exist in isolation on the chain. It uses outputs that are likely to occur in other ring signatures. So, you know, in some sense, the actions that I take in some ways can affect the actions of other users ring signatures too. And this is something that's kind of a constant theme throughout everything that we're gonna talk about. Um, and there are in fact other reasons why these zero mix in transactions are bad. But at any rate, we realized that these zero mix in transactions were bad. <laughs> and after that, basically decided to start implementing um, minimum requirements. And by minimum requirements, I mean, you know, consensus enforced minimums. Not just that, oh, my wallet will by default show me that I should use a ring signature of you know, two or three or five or whatever. 
but that if I do not send a transaction that has at least that many entries in the ring, it will be rejected by the network. So that's called consensus enforcement. So it's, it will not be accepted by the network whatsoever. It is no longer optional. Um, so that was instituted. And effectively, we've, over the years, kind of iterated on larger and larger ring sizes to mitigate certain kinds of analysis that we're going to talk about. So eliminating the so-called zero mix-in or ring size one case was kind of the first step. Um, but there are reasons that we'll talk about later why we continue to increase it over time. I mean, I think you have a graphic, do you not? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I, can, I can pull that up real quick. Let me start sure. sharing the screen um, real quick. So you can see here the sort of history based off of Monero's uh, ring size. So you can see initially through 2014 through March of 2016, you could send those zero decoy transactions, the zero mix in transactions, where you made it incredibly obvious. Like uh, there, there's no possible way any other output could have been used in sending that transaction. There is only one that could be used. And so those, uh, of course, had limiting privacy for those transactions. They were still protected with stealth addresses, but ultimately it was really obvious where they were coming from. But more importantly, these transactions also impacted the other transactions. We'll talk about the idea of chain reactions and such later. So in t early, um, March 2016, Monero moved to a minimum ring size of three. And then this was around for about a year, year and a half until September 2017 when it was raised to five. And then in 2018, we learned about another attack we'll speak about. And so we raised it to seven. And then in 2018, we decided, you know what, let's preemptively bump it to 11 to take advantage, sort of split some of the benefits of bulletproofs to get better privacy and also better efficiency. So this chart, I think, does a pretty good job summarizing what happens up to this point. We started at one, and then we raised to three, five, seven. And then it's important to note that when we updated it to 11 in September of 2018, it is now a mandatory ring size. You previously could send other ring sizes, but now you can only send it with this exact ring size. So that's a quick history of Monero's ring sizes. Yeah, and yeah, and as you had mentioned, you know, prior to the most recent upgrade to a mandatory fixed ring size of 11, we only enforced minimum ring sizes. Um, absent other information, again, and there's certain kinds of analysis for which this is correct and certain kinds for which it's not, but for certain kinds of analysis, larger ring sizes to a point are in general better. You know, you have in theory more plausible deniability, um, and as we'll talk about later, you know, it, it can thwart other kinds of analysis as well. Um, so, you know, prior to very recently, you know, you could make a ring as large as you want, and you would see occasionally just absurd numbers. I mean, what was the largest ring size we saw? It was, gosh, I want to say it was like over a thousand or something. It was over a thousand. It was just absurd, and you could do this. You know it's going to cost you more in fees because um, the size of your transaction does go up as you increase ring sizes. You know, you might say, well, why didn't we just immediately make rings gigantic all of a sudden? Well, you have to pay for that, unfortunately. The ring signature itself involves some cryptographic constructions that have to be stuck onto the chain with your transaction. That takes up space. Space is going to cost you in fees and in verification time um, as other folks download the chain and check it. So there are always trade-offs with this, particularly in terms of efficiency. So we'd like them to be as big as necessary, but not necessarily larger. Um, and as you had said, when we decided to enforce the mandatory um, enforced ring size of 11, so right now you cannot send a transaction with any ring size besides 11. It will be rejected by the network. That was also to reduce distinguishability. You know, if like, if for whatever reason you always decide to use, I don't know, ring size 69 as a random example, you know, then if someone sees a one transaction on the chain eventually with ring size 69, they'll be like, oh, that must be that ring size 69 guy. Huh, must be sending something to someone. So that's not good for distinguishability. In general, transactions should look as identical as possible. So it was done to reduce distinguishability with the idea that there are certain kinds of, of analysis we'll talk about later for which a larger ring size is not necessarily that valuable. So that's why they've increased. They're all prime numbers, which I had not realized until someone said, oh man, is there some deep mathematical reason why all the ring size increases are prime numbers? I was like, no. <laughs> it's like, oh, but surely you meant it as a math joke, right? It's like, no, I did not. Maybe some other people saw it, but I didn't. I felt foolish. I've studied math for a long time, but I don't know. I couldn't see the prime numbers for the trees. No, so anyway, that's yeah. where our ring sizes are now. Um, 
And again, some of the changes were made, you know, coinciding with, for example, the, um, the Ring CT deployment. And Ring CT deployment was when we made um, some fairly major changes to also hide amounts of transactions. Um, in some sense, we can also talk about the fact that that was very good too, because prior to that, how you had to do ring signatures was kind of a little bit wonky. So if I was sending 123 Monero early, prior to the ring CT deployment, what you basically do is kind of break them up almost like you break up dollar bills, right? So I'd have kind of like 100 Monero note or output. I might have, you know, a couple of 10 Monero notes, for example, and some one Monero notes. You can kind of denominate them however you want. It's, it's up to you when you come up with your own Monero clone, right? Um, and so what you would effectively do is for that 100 Monero note, you would go and pull you know, a bunch of other 100 Monero notes together and kind of make a ring with those and so on. So it was kind of this like, I don't know, useful at the time, but fairly wonky approach where you had to kind of just pull based on denomination. So there were some impacts on this too, where if you have very small amounts, it's very unlikely that you'd be able to find necessarily you know, equally denominated amounts you know, as part of the, this big pool of denominated notes and stuff. You know, it kind of became a mess and it's not great for analysis because you know, it's dependent on the denominations that other folks are sending, and that's not great. So the Ring CT deployment was fantastic for many reasons, but one of them was there are no more amounts in Monero transactions. You can't see what they are. That doesn't mean you can make up numbers. The math does all have to check out, and that's part of why we had to kind of alter our ring signatures a bit is to make that work. Um, but it did mean that now instead of having to worry about, oh man, how many hundred Monero outputs are there that I can kind of hide among my ring, that doesn't matter anymore. You can just arbitrarily choose these you know, post ring CT outputs and build a ring out of them. So it's pretty fantastic. It's, it's great for a lot of reasons, it's better for efficiency, it's a lot better for distinguishability, and it effectively makes the pool of outputs from which you can choose from you know, as kind of as wide as possible within the ring CT environment. Can you talk a little bit more about the sort of discovery process before the first Monero Research Lab papers were published? Was it well known that Monero had limitations or was that, or did someone say, hey, you know, people with PhDs or PhD candidates, look at this and find if you can break it. How, how did that sort of process work in the early days? Um, so, you know, so it was, it was fairly well known that there were limitations to this, you know, in particular because the blockchain does, I should say the blockchain introduces structure. Right. So on its own, as like this beautiful mathematical ideal, you know, a, ring, a linkable ring signature does exactly what it says in the box. Right. It provides, you know, perfect, plausible deniability of the sender in a particular, you know, in general, it can be any kind of message. We use it for transaction messages. Right. So in kind of its own little environment, you know, it's ideal and it has great provable security properties and we absolutely love it. But the second that you start introducing structure into the blockchain and by structure, I mean, you know, we have like an ordering of transactions. We know that certain outputs, you know, might be chosen in different ways based on how you're randomly choosing the outputs for your ring signature. You know, some people might interact with exchanges, which may have some information about what they've been doing. Um, you know, when we had denominated amounts, there was a lot of information about amounts that you were sending. If you're sending the same amount every time, you know, any time that you are able to glean any little bit of information, any kind of structure, any kind of metadata, you know, that's not good. That is something that an adversary might be able to use to generate either some kind of provable analysis or some kind of heuristic, which, as we said, is basically an unprovable guess based on, you know, supposed behavior. So some of those things were known. Um, they weren't necessarily formalized um, right away. They are kind of documented in some, you know, it's very, very hip these days to publish a paper on some little part of Monero analysis. And in MRL, we get sent papers often of not the highest quality talking about some little part of Monero's analysis, often involving race signatures. Um, but in the early days, we didn't really have a lot of that. Um, some of the Monero Research Lab papers, uh, the numbers are one, I always forget the numbers, I think it's one in four, um, talk about some of those early analyses, You know, one of which involves things involving zero mix-in transactions, how that interacted with some of the earlier kind of pre-ring CT denominated amount stuff. And some other ones also had to do with um, some so-called chain reaction attacks that we'll be talking about, I believe in the next episode or a later episode. You know, so it's very much kind of an ongoing process. And, you know, part of why I like the fact that Monero is able to kind of iterate so well with its, you know, regular network upgrade schedule is that we can take into account some of these things that are found and iterate on them. You know, uh, an asset, for example, like Bitcoin, that doesn't really have to worry about this. You know, Bitcoin is about as transparent as you can possibly get. You know, there's, there's really no privacy concerns in that sense on which they have to iterate. But for something like Monero, you know, the analysis, the analyses aren't going to get worse. You know, the analyses that people do are only going to get better. And that's not a bad thing. You know, when folks do publish work, 
you know, whether or not it's high quality, like I like to see it because I like to know that we can use that information to make Monero better. Um, but it also means that it's very helpful that we can iterate so rapidly. As you saw in that chart, ring size goes up because we learn about different forms of analysis that we want to avoid, among other things that we iterate on. Cool. So given that we've sort of improved Monero's ring size in the past and we've sort of covered most of the at least basic forms of attack that we're, we're, we're concerned about, do you still think that ring signatures remain one of Monero's greatest limitations? In terms of limitations, I would say I would say yes, but primarily in the sense of like an annoyance. You know, that like that that if you're going to do any kind of analysis on Monero, and again, there's plenty of papers out there, some of which are great, some of which I think are pretty low quality. Um, a lot of them will deal with analysis that comes out of the fact that ring signatures provide a limited anonymity set. So, you know, if I know that one of 11 outputs was spent and generated some output, which itself was used as one of a bunch of different rings, again, that invites structure, and that structure invites analysis. Um, and it is surprisingly difficult to avoid all possible heuristics. So if someone points out, my goodness, there's a heuristic there, I'm like, yeah, you know, anytime you have structure, you're going to be able to come up with, you know, some kind of metric that you might use to try to make informed guesses about, you know, what output a true sender is. And generally, if you're using Monero well, that doesn't really have a practical impact on your privacy, but it's still something we want to avoid because again, attacks don't get worse, they only get better over time. Um, so I would say that it is the biggest source of annoyance. You know, I've long been an advocate of, you know, someday we will get rid of ring signatures and it will be a good thing if we do it correctly. Um, and I still think that that is absolutely the case. You know, a lot of what we do ends up being analysis surrounding that. And, you know, it's a good thing that we're using our time that way, but if we can move on to something that's better in terms of sender anonymity and ambiguity, we could use our time elsewhere. And that might be nice. Sorry, I'm muting myself now. Um, so, so given that, why hasn't Monero sort of tried to move on to one of these other systems? It doesn't seem to be developing one of these other systems yet. Mm -hmm. um, is is it just that ring signatures are sort of still the, the best thing we're aware of now? Or what, what are the given circumstances? Yeah, so like I had said before, um, for some kinds of analysis, not all of them, larger ring sizes are better. And I kind of use larger ring size as kind of a proxy for sender anonymity sets. And again, sender anonymity does not mean wallet addresses. It means kind of these one-time addresses. So there's an additional layer of obfuscation there. I always like to, to mention that when I can. Um, but again, making just arbitrarily large ring sizes, while it would help some attacks and, and analyses, is hugely cost ineffective. You know, so for example, if we went from ring size 11 to like ring size 1,000, so you know, your output is one of 1,000 that you just plucked off of the chain, for example, that is going to be a very, very large transaction and it's going to be you know, fairly expensive to generate that ring signature, because when you do a transaction, part of the time it takes is actually generating this cryptographic ring signature structure. And it means that everyone else who downloads the blockchain pays for that space, and also for the time it takes to verify that that was done correctly. There are very small amounts of time, like on the order of you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds per transaction to verify that the ring signature is correct, and that's important to do. Um, but that really adds up, right? When you have you know a few million transactions and everyone says, my God, why is it so slow to do blockchain validation? That's part of it. Those little, little times add up over time. So some things would be you know made better if we could do that. But unfortunately, we don't know a way to make a very, very large ring signature that is also efficient. Um, there are some schemes that have been proposed for doing similar you know linkable ring signatures in ways that would let us make the rings very large, like on the order of a thousand, um, without taking up that much space. But unfortunately, mathematically, you have to pay for that with verification time. So the answer to that is like, can we make ring sizes bigger, not without paying you know, some horrible consequence, right? There's always like a horrific catch to it. And that's the horrific catch for that. Um, like you kind of hinted at, there are other schemes that do not use ring signatures at all for sender um, ambiguity and anonymity. Um, so for example, like the zero coin and zero cash projects, um, those have effectively as large of anonymity set as you could possibly get. That is, their anonymity sets are effectively every single you know, note or output or whatever they call it that has been placed onto the chain. Now, how that interacts with other forms of privacy, like amounts and, for example, uh, recipient anonymity and privacy, that depends on the particular scheme, right? So, for example, the original zero coin paper um, was one of these proposals that would have had a large anonymity set, but you didn't have any control over amounts. You can only send like unit amounts. It was designed as kind of like a Bitcoin laundry, you know? Cool, I guess, but you know they paid for it in other ways. In particular, by not being able to have um, uh, by not being able to have particular amounts, 
And also trust comes into play a lot. So the zero cash project, for example, of which Zcash is kind of a modif modified instantiation, that kind of solved the zero coin problem by allowing you to do arbitrary amounts. You know, if you've used the Zcash system, for example, you know you can send whatever amount you want, kind of like in Monero. Um, and you do get a very large anonymity set if you stay within this Zcash so-called shielded pool of fairly private transactions. But in that case, they pay for it originally in terms of um, generating the, the proofs involved with that. They, while being very, very small, which is good on the blockchain, took a long time to generate. So they paid for it in that sense. And they also paid for it in the now probably famous or infamous, depending how you look at it, you know, a Zcash multi-party computation, or why well, am I blanking on the word they use for that? The ceremony, right? Um, where the Zcash instantiation of this big proving system that lets them do all this fancy math involves some computation that had to be, you had to basically trust that the folks who did it um, were not compromised, or at least that one of them was not compromised. So there's always these limitations, right? Ideally, we want something that has very, very large sender anonymity. We also want something that allows us to do arbitrary amounts, for example, like Monero and Zcash do. We also want something ideally that doesn't require me to trust that a group of people did some original ceremony correctly, because maybe I trust them, but maybe I don't. And I also want to make sure that that's efficient, right? You know, originally I couldn't use, for example, you know, a phone to do a shielded Zcash transaction because it took a long time, even though they were able to have very small proofs. Whereas in Monero, we can do stuff pretty quickly, but if I want to increase that ring size, I got to pay for it in terms of space and a little bit in terms of time. So the answer to that, to make a long story a slight bit longer, is that there is nothing right now that gives us everything that I want. And that's a very hot topic of academic research right now, is how to get rid of some of those things that we don't like. I am personally of the opinion that if you cannot accept trust in a centralized party, like the Zcash company or whoever, um, then Monero is probably your best option right now for getting reasonable sender ambiguity. But again, someday, ideally, we'll be able to get all of those things that we want. And I would love to move to that if it works for us. Excellent. Um, so are there any other final thoughts you want to have in this sort of initial introduction to ring signatures and like their, their history before we move on in future episodes to the specific attacks on them and, and other aspects of Monero? Uh, I'm trying to see my notes if there's anything else. Yeah, I mean, the gist of it, I think, is really that they do what they say on the box, mm -hmm. but blockchains introduce structure. So that's where a lot of our, a lot of our annoyances come from. You know, the process has definitely been iterative, but that's because that we've been learning over time, you know, what's the ways you can use external information and that structure that's introduced by the blockchain and people's interactions with it, you know, that those things are what give us the problem. You know, so when, when you know, when you might kind of flippantly say, oh, ring signatures have all these problems. Well, like, not really. Like the structure itself, like the cryptographic ideal mathematical construction, you know, that you can read about in the academic literature, does exactly what it says it's going to do. The ring signature itself is not broken. What it does do though, is it introduces this structure and that structure allows for all different kinds of analysis that give you varying levels of annoyance and that we try to iterate on. You know, it's very much like a belt and suspenders and second belt and gluing the pants to yourself kind of thing, right? Where we try to iterate on things that we think could potentially be, you know, any kind of a problem for our users um, in order to Im you know, improve privacy to the extent possible. Like we said in the first episode, privacy is not a switch you flip on or off. It's very much dependent on your threat model, on the risk you're willing to take, you know, and the particular kinds of analysis that we think are going to be relevant to our users. So it's all a compromise, right? Any anyone who claims that they figured this out without compromise either doesn't know what they're talking about or does and is just full of shit. So we do, I think, the best that we can do given the limitations that we know our users are willing to accept. And so for the, to leave us to the last comment, um, is there any sort of risk, like there's one major risk that users should sort of avoid, one action users can do to avoid um, the majority of risks, what, what would that really be? Hmm. So Not I guess, using right, so, so I think I, I would say that, that in general, probably the most issues that might come up for users um, end up when you interact with an entity that has more information about you. Right, so kind of the big classic example for this is exchanges, right? It would be fantastic if I could like pay my rent in Monero and do all this kind of stuff using Monero in a way that wouldn't necessarily require me going to a regulated exchange and converting to fiat currency and stuff. But I also understand that's not the world we live in. And if I'm gonna pay my rent, 
I'm probably going to use, you know, do that in my local currency. And that will likely, depending on where I live, involve me going to a regulated exchange that may know, for example, you know, information about my Monero address. It could involve information about me personally and where I live and all sorts of personal data. You know, and interactions with those entities are things that could cause problems, you know, if done repeatedly or, you know, kind of flippantly or in ways that you are worried might kind of turn evil later on. So if you are very, very worried, if you have a threat model that would not necessarily allow that, you know, then maybe giving your name, address, personal identification numbers and things to a regulated entity might not be for you. But you know, I would say for, for the majority of reasonable use cases that I think we tend to consider on a day-to-day -day basis, um, Monero does an excellent job of that. You know, and its recent iterations have gotten a lot better. So ring signatures, I wouldn't say worry me, they annoy me. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that annoyance, thanks, Sarang, for your insight today. <laughs> oh, it's gonna get it's gonna get so much more annoying when we go into details on particular annoyances. Yeah. This has been very purposely vague, I'll say today, uh, and yeah. we're going to talk a lot about more about different kinds of analysis, both historic and kind of modern day, Absolutely. as we continue so on the series. This has really helped to set the stage for everyone who is sort of relearning about Monero's history or being reintroduced into it, and then also understanding ring signatures on a high level and sort of how many researchers approach them because they've been a source of annoyance for many years now and a lot of a lot of focus in, in, as far as research and development is concerned All right. yeah and i mean and if and if any of the viewers want to know more you know if they're a little bit more mathematically inclined and want to know a bit more about the details of how they work you know resources um, I mean, zero to monero is kind of a, a fairly well endorsed technical guide to how Monero works. And you can see that at the Monero website. And that does have, a, I think, a really good explanation of the math behind the rig signatures, if you want to understand that. Um, you won't really have to understand that to understand the rest of the episodes. But if you want more details, they are available. Exactly. All right, thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope that this episode of Breaking Monero will help you understand more about these ring signatures. And it's really critical that you understand at least the basics for the rest of the series. Um, so again, thanks to Rang for being here with me today. Thanks for you, the viewer, for watching uh, today's episode. And we hope to have you watch future episodes, especially those where we get far more granular on specific attacks that people are worried about. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. See ya.